So, um, welcome to the to the virtual book launch. Um, the grant funding for this book launch has been provided by the Middlesex County Board of Chosen Freeholders through a grant award from the Middlesex County Cultural and Arts Trust Fund. This project is supported in part by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts. Additional support is provided by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Endowment, the Voorhees Family Endowment, and donors to the Zimmerle's Major Exhibitions Fund. Catherine and James Bergen, Joyce and Alvin Glassgold, Sunday and Randy Jones, and Hina and Himanshu Panya. The publication received support from the class of 1937 publications, endowment fund, and also the National Endowment for the Arts. So I have a few more people to thank um, before we begin. The book was published by Herma Press, and I want to thank Elizabeth Rishow Shalem, who is the senior editor at Hermer. All the work at the museum is collaborative, and I thank the full staff for their efforts to realize both this book, the exhibition, and also the programs that will um, come both this year and next year. The exhibition would have opened in September of 2020, but due to the pandemic, we've, we've postponed the exhibition and it will open on September 1st in 2021. Um, for the book, I wanna thank Stacy Smith and Kiki Michael. And for tonight, I wanna thank Austin Lasada, Amanda Potter, Nicole Simpson, and Carla Zarita, who are serving as our tech crew for this event. I also want to acknowledge the work of advisors and collaborators on the project who helped us with the book, the exhibitions, and the programs. My heartfelt thanks to Lisbeth Tellefson, first of all, for creating the archive that is at the center of the project to co-curator Jerry Began and Nicole Fleetwood, to Stephanie Jemison and Diane Huff, sorry, Diane Huff, who are all part of the project team right from the beginning. At Rutgers, we also had a large group of advisors, including Usina Aladu, Brittany Cooper, Joan Collier, Keisha Dabrowski, Renee Larrier, Carter Mathis, Felicia McGinty, and Michelle Stevens. So the format for this evening will be a conversation with images. First, I will introduce all the panelists and provide a few images to give you an idea of the exhibition and the interior of the book. I've also asked my colleagues to choose a few images of their own to talk about briefly. Please save your questions for the end. Um, we are also pleased to offer closed captions and Spanish translations for our guests this evening. And if you'd like to activate either of those options, um, you can look for the link in the chat for the Spanish translation option, and you can look on the closed captioning button um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And Austin, you can go to the next slide. Um, let me, um, let me first actually introduce our, our panelists. So my name is Donna Gustafson. I'm the interim director and the curator for American and modern art at the Zimmerle Art Museum. Um, my co-curator is Jerry Began. He's a design historian and critic and currently and recently served as interim dean at Mason Gross School of the Arts in Rutgers University, New Brunswick. Um, his research focuses on the materiality of the printed image and on print's role in creating and sustaining specific imagined collectivities. Whether it be Fin de Siècle London or 1960s Oakland. Uh, Jerry's book, The Mass Image 2008, provides the first substantial account of the emergence of photographic imagery in the popular press. He's published essays and reviews on design history and print practices in journals including the New York Times, Design Issues, the Journal of Visual Culture, and the Journal of Design History. Lisbeth Tellefson is an Oakland, California-based archivist, collector, curator, and publisher. Her archives and collections range from Cuban posters and Black LGBT culture to Angela Davis and the Black Panther Party, and are used frequently for research, media projects, and exhibitions. As an archival consultant, she has worked on numerous films, including the documentaries Black Panthers, Vanguard of the Revolution by Firelight Films, 
and Free Angela and All Political Prisoners by Real Side Productions. Her collections have been exhibited most recently in Angela Davis Outspoken, currently online at the GLBT Historical Society, The Art of Collaboration at Yale's Beinecke Library, Get with the Action, Political Posters from the 1960s to the Present at SFMOMA, and All Power to the People, Black Panthers at 50 at the Oakland Museum of California. In 2012, the Lisbeth Tellefsen papers were acquired by Yale University. Additionally, over 100 objects from the Tellefsen collection now reside in the permanent collections of SFMOMA, the Oakland Museum of California, and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, with a dozen pieces from the Tellefsen collection featured in the Smithsonian's 2016 inaugural exhibition. In addition to her own archival projects, most recently rescuing the papers of the late actor activist Brock Peters, she works as an archival consultant, helping find institutional homes for archival collections, and as a personal archivist to musician Esperanza Spaulding. Nicole Fleetwood is a writer, curator, and professor of American Studies and Art History at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. Her books are Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration, 2020, which has been recently published and has received rave reviews all um, in many, many um, publications. It also just opened at PS1 MoMA as an exhibition in its own right. It opened on September 17th and has also received rave reviews um, by, among others, Colin Carter in the New York Times. Her other books are On Racial Icons, Blackness and the Public Imagination, 2015, and Troubling Vision, Performance, Visuality, and Blackness from 2011. She was co-curator, sorry, co-editor of Aperture's magazine's Prison Nation, a special issue focusing on photography's role in documenting mass incarceration. She has also curated and co-curated exhibitions and events on art and mass incarceration at MoMA PS1, at the Andrew Freeman House, at Aperture, at Cleveland Public Library, the Zimmerly Art Museum, Mural Arts Philadelphia, and Eastern State Penitentiary Historic Site. Now, I want to just turn to some images in order to give you a little background about um, the exhibition. So um, our exhibition and book mark 50 years from Angela Davis's arrest in New York on charges of murder, conspiracy, and kidnapping after an ill-fated rescue attempt in a California courtroom resulted in the death of several men, including a federal judge. When the guns used um, in this courtroom revolt were traced back to Angela Davis, the FBI moved to arrest her. She went underground and, and um, evaded capture for several months, but was arrested in New York City in October of 1970 and extradited to California to stand trial. Immediately, a committee was founded to free Angela and all political prisoners, and it soon became an international committee. The Cuban government, issued posters by Felix Beltran, which you see here, calling for her freedom. And as you can see from this photograph of Havana circa 1971, used the poster to create billboards in the city. Um, if you could go to the next slide. In Oakland, California, and in New York, demonstrations and marches, um, called for Angela's freedom. And next slide. In Paris, Ania Davis, Angela Davis's sister, marched with a crowd of 100,000, carrying um, images of her face and calling for freedom for Angela Davis. And in London, um, demonstrations, next, yeah. In London, demonstrations took place outside the um, American Embassy. And I, I want to say that all the images that I've just shown you are all from uh, Elizabeth Tellefson's archive. Uh, next slide. 
Um, also, artists such as Faith Ringgold that you see here, Charles White, and Elizabeth Catlett, and others created posters for the effort and drew attention to the larger issues of racism and mass incarceration. These two are images from Lisbeth's archive. Um, and then next slide. So after, um, after Angela Davis served 16 months in prison because she was refused bail for those 16 months, she was tried and found innocent of all charges by an all white jury in California. She immediately went on a national and world tour to support her, um, her supporters, to thank her supporters who she credited with winning her freedom and went on to continue the fight to free others that were unjustly imprisoned. Her work on prison abolition and intersectional feminism, her work against global and local injustice, and her attention to the systems of racial capitalism, mass incarceration, and global inequity have made Angela Davis an icon for the age. Her history, her publications, her legacy continues to inspire. And for that reason, the exhibition and book include work by contemporary artists. For example, as you can see here, these are um, images from a past installation by Sadie Barnett, um, which is titled My Father's FBI File, um, and include um, reproductions of the actual FBI file that was um, that was collected on her father, Rodney Barnett, um, for many, many years secretly and was made known to the family through a Freedom of Information Act. Um, so we're very excited. Sadie Barnett will create a new installation for the Zimmerly in our exhibition. And then the next slide is, is um, another contemporary artist, a project that we're very excited to have at the Zimmerly Art Museum by Stephanie Jemison and Justin Hicks. This is a research image for a project that's still in, in development, um, but will be a, a fantastic addition to the exhibition, to the images of the archive. Um, so for us, the book and the exhibition start with the image of Angela Davis, but acknowledge, as she does, that it was the work of a large and international coalition of supporters that really freed her, and her influence continues. Um, and that's the story that we will tell, both with the exhibition and um, is presented in, in the book that we're celebrating here tonight. So I'm now going to turn um, the uh, screen to Lisbeth Tellefson, who has ch chosen to talk about two images. And um, Lisbeth, if you, Austin, if you'll change to the next image, and then Lisbeth will be able to, to tell us um, what these images mean to her. Awesome. And uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody that showed up. I see uh, a healthy number of, of people who came out this afternoon, at least on the West Coast. So super excited about that. Um, for me, this image, which was, uh, which appeared in uh, September 11th, 1970 issue of Life Magazine, was kind of, I'll say the gateway to this whole archive. Um, I grew up in old school print culture. I've run printing presses for the last 30 years and, and uh, something like this in 1970, which was in many ways the heyday of the alternative press, this one full page image was taken and manipulated in myriad ways by artists and activists all around the globe. So this exhibition will probably feature, I don't know, maybe could be as many as 10 different iterations of this one photograph. And um, it also speaks to me because my earliest ambitions as a collector and an archivist were really related to graphic culture, print culture, posters. Um, 
I may have been a little young to actually have this poster on my wall, but some 30, 40 years later, my love of posters would, by happenstance, actually lead to the creation of this archive. Um, so uh, Austin, you can go to the next, uh, yeah. So this, um, to me, Angela Davis and to some extent the Panthers, um, their, their story, their trajectory, their iconography lends itself to visual culture. I mean, from the original poster on the left, which took that same Life magazine image and just put some verbiage on it and got it right out into the street, from the artistic renditions that you can see, um, like the, the Wadsworth Gerald Afro Cobra image, um, all the way down to the bottom right image, which is a contemporary shepherd fairy in 2002. Her image still resonates. And there are not that many people who um, visually um, are instantly recognizable, like a Che Guevara would be. Um, which also happened to be the basis of the exhibit that I did previously with uh, curator Jerry Began. So yeah, I chose this just because um, it really speaks full circle to, you know, how this project came to be. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. So then these two images were chosen by, by Jerry Began. So Jerry, do you want to uh, let talk a little bit about these? Unmute and do that. And thank you, Donna. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, it's been a long term project. This it's, you know, come from Lisbeth's archive. It's taken uh, decades to compile the archive. It's taken us, a number of years to get this together. Anyway, the reason I, I chose this uh, to talk about, uh, there's four reasons actually. Um, this is a poster that the London Angela Davis Defense Committee put together uh, in 1971. And it's to mark the publication of Angela Davis's first book. So when Angela Davis was in prison, she produced a book, you know, she, she not only um, helped to defend herself and, and organize her defense committee, um, uh, but she, she uh, helped to edit and wrote um, this book, If They Come in the Morning. Uh, the idea for that had actually come from the London Defense Committee initially. They thought that she should do a book about, about her story and about the carceral system in the United States while she was in prison. And um, so this, I think, to me, speaks to Angela Davis as an intellectual, the importance of her as one of the great um, figures in American intellectual life as a, a black feminist thinker. Um, it speaks to me of the collective nature of the campaign uh, and of the book. So if they come in the morning consists of a writing by Angela, but it also contains uh, writings by other uh, incarcerated black people uh, who are delineating uh, the system that's put them where they are. And that includes uh, Rochelle McGee, George Jackson, uh, Erica Huggins, uh, Huey P. Newton. There's a, a wonderful essay at the beginning, or, or letter at the beginning of the book from uh, James Baldwin to Angela. And he relates her imprisonment to the imprisonment of, of all black people. So uh, that his letter is the inspiration of the title, If They Come in the Morning. And I'll just read the end of his letter. He says, we must fight for your life as though it were our own, which it is. 
and render impassable with our bodies the corridor to the gas chamber. Um, for if they take you in the morning, they will come for us that night. So this relates Angela's struggle, Angela's imprisonment, to a much wider set of people. And, um, you know, the, the, the text on the poster, Voices of Resistance, lists a few people who, who are in the book. It's still a fascinating book and a, a classic text. It also speaks, the design of the poster to me, as a designer and a design historian, it speaks to, um, in a wonderfully graphic way, the raised fist with a book in it, uh, to the power of knowledge and learning within um, the black community at this point, that Angela is a figurehead for, uh, as a young, um, college professor with an on an incredible academic uh, trajectory. So, and then the final reason for choosing it for me was because I think by putting out this material, by putting out the archive, hopefully we can gather more information. These ten things tend to get lost in history. And one of the amazing things that Lisbeth has done is just collect everything she can find. Uh, and put it together so we, we can connect things. We can connect a photograph of uh, Fania Davis in Paris with a poster design that Elizabeth also has. Now, I do not know who designed this poster. I can guess, you know, that they also designed the book cover. Because if we look at the next slide, uh, this is also by the London Angela Davis Defense Committee. And they're unusual in that they also use the same typeface, which is not, it's a little bit graphic-y, I'd say, the typeface. Um, and they always use these kind of self-referential. The previous poster was a book within a poster. This one's a poster within a poster. And I'd love to know who did these. You know, I think it's important. And I think getting that information out in the book and in the exhibition hopefully will lead to a, the archive growing still further so we can find this, find who, out who did these. And of course, the great thing about this is they're, as Lisbeth said, they're kind of, they're flipping something that was intended to, to bring Angela into prison, to confine her and eventually to kill her. They're using that to help free her. So just as the, the Life magazine, um, you know, Angela herself said that when she saw that in a, in a shop when she was on the run, she was convinced that Life was in cahoots with J. Edgar Hoover. You know, she found that and the wanted poster to be equal in many ways. So the fact that these activists all over the world um, use these images to actually you know, bring her to public attention in a positive way and eventually to, to free her, to me, is, is um, an amazing story. So um, I think that's about all I, I can say for now. But uh, it's a pleasure to talk about this stuff. It's amazing stuff. And then these, these next images were chosen by Nicole Fleetwood. So Nicole, I would love to hear what you have to say about these. Well, good evening, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, and you know, thanks to everyone involved in making this happen. Happen, Lisbeth. Thank you so much for the incredible archive, and I would love to hear more about your your the process of collecting. Thank you, Donna and Jerry, for curating and bringing us all together, and the team of Zimmerly, um, who all the people behind the scenes who are making it happen. So I am, um, you know, I am an enormous like. I love Angela Davis. I'm a huge fan. Uh, uh, probably the only person that I'm in awe of on the planet is Angela Davis. Um, and, you know, I chose these two images for multiple reasons. Um, one is that I think that they reflect on the fact that um, at that moment in, in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, that Black artists, writers, musicians, entertainers, thinkers were 
um, you know, there, 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 was a, there was a shared aesthetic and politics um, that was, I think, reflective in both of these artworks. And, you know, when Angela was on trial and was in prison, she had so many Black celebrities and public figures, you know, really advocating and speaking for speaking um, in support of her, and, uh, Aretha Franklin, James Baldwin, as um, Jerry mentioned. And Elizabeth Catlett made Angela Libra um, this serial lithograph. It was based on a, a really famous photograph of, of a smiling Davis. Um, I think that this lithograph is just, one, I think it's stunning. I love these six renditions of her, but I also am really moved by how she made them to support Angela Davis's defense campaign. So she, um, these prints were used literally to fund the defense campaign. Um, and I also think the title reflects something that Catlett and Davis shared, which is a sense of black internationalism. Um, like Davis, Catlett was also, you know, brought like art and activism and imagery together. Um, she was involved with um, a lot of leftist artists in Mexico. She eventually moved to Mexico um, and uh, was involved in art collectives there. Um, and then I think that Elizabeth already mentioned briefly Wadsworth Gerald's piece that was part of his work with Afro Cobra, a black radical um, artist collective. And um, this work, Revolutionary by him, uh, was also included in the Brooklyn Museum exhibit on, we wanted a revolution about black radical women um, a few years ago that was received a lot of wonderful praise. Um, one of the things that I think is so powerful about this rendition is he takes one of the most famous photographs of Davis, the one in life. And as um, Jerry was saying that, the Life Magazine's rendition representation of her was akin to the FBI in terms of the, you know, violent, pejorative, criminalized way in which she was represented. And um, Gerald flips that on its head. So he, in turn, instead of um, using the pejorative of fugitive, he, Frank, he titles this revolutionary. And he renders her through words and there's these colorful spiraling words that actually come from her speech like revolt resist and struggle um and he also turned this into um, a, ser a limited series of seriographs that were also released next please next slide so in my my current work um i just might as uh, donna said my book marking time um just came out and i have an exhibition at ps1 and um, so much of the um, thinking and scholarship in that book and that project grows out of the work that Angela Davis has been doing for years on prison abolition, um, which also start with that great image of if they come and if they come in the morning. Did I say that correctly, Jerry? I think so. Um, yeah, right. So it's this body of scholarship and knowledge and art that grows from black folks in captivity. So, so much of the black radical tradition emerges in prison. And I think Angelo's work and her activism really brings that to the fore, instead of having it as this kind of marginal conversation or something that we're talking about people who are in spaces of captivity, but we're actually learning from them and that they're at the forefront of this movement towards liberation. Thank you. That's great. Um, so uh, thank you all for sharing um, your images and your thoughts about images. Um, I think at this point we are ready to um, dispense with the with the shared screen and maybe we can all try to have a conversation together. And Donna, I should have just said that that last image I showed also by Tamika Cole is for Tamika is from Birmingham, Birmingham. Oh, interesting. And she was in Alabama. She was in prison in Alabama. So again, just like making more connections to this legacy of, of Angela Davis. Yeah, that's great. That's a great point. Um, so I I prepared a couple of questions just to sort of get us started, but I hope that we can we can um, enjoy this as more of a conversation and rather rather than just me. Um, acting as, as the moderator in, the, in this group. But one of the things that I w thought would be really interesting to, for all of us to think about is how, how and why has Angela remained such an icon? And 
so like for, I, I mean to say, how has her image endured? And why is it so important to remember her story? And why in particular is it important to remember her story now? Does anybody want to start the conversation? Well, Elizabeth, you, I quoted you in my article. You said something, um, and I, I'm sorry, I don't even remember where I put the quote, but I loved it so much about um, Angela being more than an icon. You, you said, I never saw Angela as an icon. Um, I saw, her, I saw her as a righteous woman, a sister, an elder who didn't crack. A lot of older folks I grew up around were disillusioned and broken, but Angela just stayed true to her beliefs, lived her beliefs. It was really powerful to have a model like that. And I, I grew up with my, my um, parents and my aunts and everyone in my community, like if there was one image they would bow to was Angela Davis. And I think it's like really reflective of a human being, not someone to be worshiped but a human being who knows the history of black subjugation and the way that state repression attempts to break people, break black people. And in every image of her, she is so self-composed. Mm -hmm. She is so like, she is so fully present and shows no, and it's not to say that she never had fear but that her, um, her commitment to her politics and to her style and to the way she was gonna walk in this world is such a um, lesson for us all, right? It's again, not to be worshiped. She doesn't want to be worshiped, mm -hmm. but it, there's a lesson there at every turn. You know, at her hardest moment, there's a lesson for us. And I think that's one reason her, for me, that's one reason her image endures. Mm. Yeah, I also think, you know, the whole, the whole project has been a little conflicting for me because knowing there are two Angelas to me. There is the Angela, who's the iconic image on the poster, who is not a real person. She's kind of an idea. And, uh, you know, that resonates all on its own. But then there's the person. And, uh, you know, even this whole project, it's been difficult to kind of navigate because, um, you know, she is somebody who has continued to live her life. And I feel like the reason she remains relevant is because she has continued to push and be on the forefront of, I, I can't even name all the different struggles. And I think you know, the idea of having the weight of the state on your neck and not killing you, she came out not only stronger, but determined to free all political prisoners, to be a voice and lead the fight against, you know, uh, oppression in the carceral state. So, you know, for me, I feel like this fight is not about her. You know, if anything, she is constantly, please don't make this about me. You know, <laughs> it's not about me. And um, yeah, I just, um, you know, I have so much admiration for the way she has continued to just fight the good fight, mm. you know? Well, I have to say that, um, I, and then Jerry, you should go, but um, one, of the th one of the things that we really wrestled with was Angela Davis's constant, constantly saying, it's not about me, right? And we wanted to do a show that, that sort of centered the image of Angela, but we, were tr but we always meant that the, the show really radiated out. As, as Jerry said to me the other day, it radiates out from the image of Angela. And it's really about the people, the images, everything that was done to keep her from being sort of locked away, you know? And then, as you say, she came out of that, you know, immediately starting a new coalition, starting a national tour to thank people going international, um, and and she has never stopped since. So she's an incredibly 
admirable um, person. Well, yeah. Donna, I think that one of the things that you and Jerry have done beautifully, and, and it's in the incredible archive of Elizabeth, is not, so this image repertoire is not about Angela. It's actually about people reproducing Angela hmm. to stand in for all these ideas that they want to live up to. Yeah. I mean, that, so it's, these are not Angela's images. These are like literally thousands of people who are imaging her, including repressive states Im imaging her, right? So it's all right. these ways that she, re she is representative of something that other people want to live up to. Yeah. Right? Um, and so I think that's what part of the, it's so interesting. And all of the, all of the images of her, I mean, there's some likeness, right? We can, we know like the Afro, we know certain things, but right, but it's all about like the kind of desires, wishes, hopes of the person who's representing her at any given moment too. Yeah. I, yeah, I think that's, that's exactly it. That, that uh, because Lisbeth has, has collected this wide range of materials, international materials, and I hope one of the other panelists might display the book because if I do it won't it won't work but just just flipping through the book uh, you see all of these different interpretations of, of, of Angela um, the French Angela is different from the Cuban Angela yes uh, but you know so that so they are as as you're saying Nicole but also as you said as well um, she used herself, her appearance, her, you know, her body, her hairstyle was very meaningful, you know, for, for a, a young black woman to dress the way she did uh, and to have her hair the way she did. It wasn't just Angela who was doing it, but she was the most visible. She became the most visible uh, young woman to have a natural. And, and as part of my research, I, I um, actually interviewed uh, Erica, Erica Huggins, and she spoke about having a natural at that point and people shouting, Brillo heads, go home. You know, mm -hmm. Brillo heads, go home. So that by Angela's appearance, by the way she, she held herself, by the sort of uh, resistance that she represented, that image became very important to many, many people and was used in, in different ways. But the, that connection to Africa, to a non-mainstream white culture that she was expressing um, through her appearance uh, was, was part of her political statement. So later on as she she writes about it uh she's written about how that image became um simply a style at, at certain times but possibly uh nicole not within the black community from what you're saying about your family um you know it wasn't simply a style that was detached from the politics well i mean angela davis said it herself that like you know, hundreds of black women across the country were being put over and harassed. Yes. And, and when she, when, when she was, when they were, when she was quote a fugitive, right? So I, her style was very much a cultural movement that was happening among, you know, black everyday subjects. And it was a real reclamation, a claiming of a type of self-representation that was not based in white nor white ideas of beauty and fashion. Mm. I mean, that is what Black is Beautiful meant. And, and, and she comes out of a tradition, a, a leftist, a very powerful leftist tradition that merged style with politics um, and, and with a type of self-presentation that was not going to buckle under white supremacist state repression. Yeah, thinking about that, um, about, yeah, the, the sort of police stopping hundreds, and in some cases it says, some accounts it says thousands of, of, of as Angela says it herself, you know, light-skinned, 
black women with naturals, uh, it remind me of of uh, of the Spartacus thing. You know, I am Spartacus. You have many Angelas. You know, there's a national thing. When when they when they're looking for Angela, where could she be? Um, she could could it be this woman? Um, and then of course she didn't look like that at all when she was when she was uh, on the run. Yeah, she completely changed her appearance. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, Elizabeth, I want to turn back to you for a second, and I just um, could you talk a little bit more about about your archive and how you make choices as to what what should be included in the archive, what, um, how you search out objects for the archive, and, and what your ultimate goal for the archive might be. And, and can I chime in there with that question? Can you, I, I'm curious, how, how did you start this archive? Like, what was the impetus behind it? You know, uh, I have to take it back to, um, in the 90s, my grandfather figure um, was a lifelong activist and uh, all of his friends were people that had had big lives and um, many of them had, had written books. And when he was in his 90s, he was desperate to write his story. He had um, become an activist in the 30s, was close personal friends with Langston Hughes and Paul Robeson. He was one of uh, several dozen young African Americans who had went, who had sailed to the Soviet Union to make a film on black life. And uh, so in the 90s, my friend Qualey and I were trying to help him write his book. I'm working with his archival material. We're doing oral histories and he died before we can get the job done. And it haunted me. And so, you know, the question of how do you archive such a big life was just with me. And uh, so, you know, I'm continuing most of my interaction with the organizations that I work with are, you know, I'm the community archivist. You know, I hold the records. I preserve the stories. And uh, I, was, I was working on an exhibit um, for a local festival, which had me compiling information from different people. And I was doing a lot of scanning. And to organize it all, I actually printed it out and put it in a binder. And I thought, well, this is helpful. I, I have a binder. I can, you know, I don't have to search for files on my computer. I can just kind of organize it. And uh, we spent all this months doing this exhibit. And uh, the day of the exhibit, people spent time looking at our curated panels, but they spent hours looking at these random binders. And so, and, as I was watching people go through these binders, I was watching something, something happen where just the physical act of turning pages with material that was resonant with them in chronological order, I was literally seeing their brains dialing back to a particular moment in time. And I had kind of this aha moment. It's like, that's kind of an interesting methodology. I wish I'd thought of that when Matt was around. So fast forward some years, and uh, as a poster collector with a focus on Cuban posters, I meet two other poster collectors, a Michael Rossman and a Lincoln Cushing, who have done tremendous archival work um, digitizing posters, and we created a project called the Political Poster Portal, where we embarked on digitizing our respective collections together to create a huge catalog. And I guess to make it sexy for me, they said, why don't we start with Angela Davis posters? And I was like, that'll work. 
And uh, so we collectively had maybe 50 posters and my job was to take the archival slides and get them. At that point, you had to send them off to Canada to get them digitized. And when the CDs came back, and I saw 50 Angela Davis posters in one place at one time where you could take that Life magazine image and trace it all around. You know, the graphic poster geek in me just went nuts. And because technology was such that you couldn't really open these types of files easily on a computer, I printed them out and put them in a binder. And as technology, as time went on, more and more content, you know, the newspapers began to digitize their archives. I printed out those stories and put them in the Angela Davis binder. And at some point, I started to correlate, you know, that question that I'd been grappling with, like, how do you how do you tell the story of a larger than life life? And at some point, I just became obsessed with this project. And uh, as happenstance would have it, newspapers began to liquidate their photo morgues. And I stumbled across the retailers who were now selling off all the photo libraries of newspapers. And I just committed and purchased all the Angela Davis and Black Panther photographs. So now my binder had become a seven volume encyclopedia. And at this point, I just treated any little piece related to this story as a piece of the jigsaw puzzle. And that I was no longer making distinctions other than financial distinctions. I will not pay $600 for an Angela Davis Prada shirt. Thank you very much. But someone could gift it to me. <laughs> um, so yeah, I stopped making distinctions. You know, as people started to visit the archive, they came with their own research questions. They came with their own, you know, so it, it's not my role to determine what these stories are or what these threads might be. Um, I have just fully committed to the process of building as complete um, an archive as possible and making sure that it gets used. So I'm really grateful um, that uh, you guys bit, you know, I planted a lot of seeds in my community in my museum contact communities and the Zimmler, you, you guys were the first ones to bite. And um, I couldn't be more excited with how this project has turned out. So I hope it's just the beginning. That's great. Elizabeth, can I, can I follow up with that? Yeah. Is it correct? I think it's correct that, that you, one of the things you've done is, is to use the binders to dig into stories so that you showed Angela the binder and went <laughs> through it with her and there were things that she remembered that 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 she'd forgotten yes it, it okay it well built. if if Angela's on this I for you know forgive me because I know you're sick of this story by now but one of my favorite stories is you know, as I'm embarking on this project as these binders as some kind of methodology, um, knowing Angela, she also had the ability to interact with them. So one day, um, my partner, who uh, Erica Huggins, who also has a long backstory with Angela, you know, they met in the 60s and there are many parallels in their life. And so Angela is going through the binder and literally I am watching this moment where she is turning the pages. I can see her brain dialing in and she stops at a fairly 
pedestrian jet magazine article, nothing too fancy. And she points at a picture and looks at Erica and says, don't you remember this? When this picture came out and I was on hunger strike and I looked gaunt with wild hair and whatnot, don't you remember that one day you were outside the jail and they let you come in and gave you a pair of scissors so you could give me a haircut? And I was just like, you know, this woman has been interviewed a gabillion times and I guarantee she had never remembered that story before. Mm. And it was really kind of an aha moment and a validation that there is something to this methodology. There is something to this. Mm. So, um, yeah. And then I'm, uh, I'm talking with a friend, Stephen Shames, who shot a lot of the Panthers and Angela back in the day. And lo and behold, we come across a photograph of one of Angela's attorneys, Doris Bryn Walker, talking to Erica through the fence. And in my head, she is asking, would you come in and give Angela a haircut? So these are the connections. These are the stories of the archive that you know, there is a million aha moments to be had. And, you know, I am just looking for more and more people to know this archive exists. Um, yeah, I just, I don't know what the future holds, but, um, you know, that's why you create this sort of a collection. That's what makes it worthwhile. And I just want to say that um, Lisbeth is putting together archives for us to have in the exhibition so people can sit in nice, comfortable chairs, flip through the flip through these binders themselves and have a similar experience, perhaps. So mm -hmm. thank you for that, Lisbeth. Mm -hmm. So I have let me just ask one more question and then it's soon time to turn to the to the audience. Um, a lot has happened since we all finished our essays for the book. Um, and I wondered if anybody had any thoughts about if we had a chance to do a second edition, for example, or um, an afterward. Is there anything that we would add to the, to the stories that we told, which really ended in early 2020? even late 219, according to the, the book schedule. And, and secondarily, um, we have a little extra time to think about what we might add to the exhibition. And that's, um, it's a big question. Mm. <laughs> no answers. Donna, is, there, is there, I mean, I'm, you know, I, as you know, I just had a show open, right? And so I think a lot of people who are doing shows, and I'm just thinking also the, about, Elizabeth, what you were saying, the materiality of the posters, that you love that, that life of the poster that doesn't quite exist like it used to, and this kind of everything's digitized and so much access that the, like the young generation, my son is 15, that he has the information is, is none, it's, well, the material access is through the computer, right? It's a different kind of surface and texture than actually walking upon um, people who are reprinting that wanted poster and the currency of that wanted poster at, at, at a moment, right? Among a lot of leftists and radicals. My point is that we're in this different moment where image circulates in such a different way than like what led you to your initial interest in poster cultures and poster and politics. And so I, I'm, do, I'm asking that question to segue into also like what it, what it means. And I don't think there's one answer to translate the power of this and the materiality of these, these, these items um, these historic, with a lot of historical significance in this moment of COVID and where the museum is closed, right? And I know that's one reason it was worth delaying another year is because part of the power of Elizabeth's archive is to actually experience it in, in person, right? To actually experience 
and see the aging paper and, and, and all the, you know, all the other things that come with um, historical documents. So I guess that's for Don, it's for everyone. I, I guess it's just more of a question for me about like how, how we still um, cultivate that experience for people, you know, when we're interested in archiving and curatorial work, especially in this period where this no touch world, right? Hmm. Right. It's a very good question. I, I think we ha we had been uh, Donna and I had been wrestling with that um, and talking about how we can, you know, as Lisbeth said, a lot of the archive is digitized. So, you know, ways in which people can interact with the archive. I, th I think, you know, the lesson, as you touched on, Nicole, uh, around Angela's life is that struggle continues, you know, that she has continued with the struggle for, a, for her entire life. Her, her 50 years ago was not the beginning of that. She'd already been an activist. Um, and it, it was just, but it was launching onto a new um, level, perhaps. So the struggle always continues and she'll always be relevant for that reason. Um, but I think ways in which we can activate the digital things, as you were suggesting, Nicole, um, and maybe archiving current activism as well around incarceration. Um, those are some things we, we had talked about and now we've got a little more time uh, to do that. Um, so I think I think we can make it relevant to what is happening now. Yeah. I just want to say also I don't know who else who out there is watching, but um, you know I'm I'm always looking for new media producers and people who are you know pushing the boundaries of interaction with digital archives. And I am the queen of content. So, you know, I feel like part of the bridge um, generationally is really to make this content available in different ways. So, uh, yeah, if anybody knows anybody out there doing anything interesting, you know, please let me know because uh, there is just there's so much and only a fraction of it, you know, a fraction of 1% is in this exhibit. So also Donna, to your, to your question, my dream for, you know, collectors like myself would be a, a real collection catalog that could serve as a reference for, you know, the posters, the photographs, the material that's been produced. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's my dream. I, I think one thing that, that there was one amazing, well, there were many amazing moments in, in putting this together, but one of them was, and I, 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 I think we were in New York, uh, but we were meeting with uh, Stephanie Jemison, who's in the show, and uh, she was talking about her family's history of, of activism. Uh, her, I think it was her grandmother. Um, and the, talking about the Angela Davis and activism, you know, for instance, I know you've done a lot of work with, with uh, Panthers, um, Lisbeth, and maybe this already exists, but forums where families, people, individuals can kind of gather their memories, gather their, their records of activism. I think are really important. I think, you know, sometimes people don't talk about that um, and they need to be um, preserved and, and they need to be able to be used as well. So possibly that already exists with the Panthers, I don't know, but um, may not in, in the sort of uh, various Angela Davis uh, campaign groups. You know, there is, um there is kind of this moment that's happening in the Bay Area because we're ground zero. There are, there are quite a lot of people who are active in different um, 
in different roles around Angela's case that are actively, you know, doing oral histories, archiving their stories. Mm. Um, so right. it is kind of a, a, a moment, right. you know, but uh, yeah, like StoryCorps or that, have you seen the, the story booth at the Smithsonian? where you can go in and tell your story. Mm. Yeah, and then I guess it needs to go somewhere. Well, one of the things I, I do wanna just um, mention is I, I, I so much appreciated your, your generosity in opening the archive up completely to to Jerry and I and um, one of the things that I found so astounding was just the mass of material that that was there. It was an incredible. Um, it was just an incredible experience of seeing history in a way that is not easy to see. And you know, Nicole, like if you go to an archive, they bring out a couple of folders or they bring out a box, but to go to Lisbeth's house and see the archive is to see a room full of paper and objects and materials, all very well organized and fantastic. But it's the that experience to me was one of the most incredible um, early moments in in meeting you and starting the project. And it it I'm still trying to find a way that we can recreate that experience in the exhibition in in some way. So. Um, we, we have to continue to talk about that, so. I think people should show their books again, because the, the, <laughs> there are pages of, uh, pages of, of pins, of uh, bumper stickers, there's magazines, there's... Uh, yeah, I think the book does a really nice, it's just incredible, it doesn't feel like a book, it feels like more than a book, so it is trying to, I think, reproduce the feel of the archive and, and yeah like the, the that reproduction of those pins I think is so it looks three-dimensional it's really beautifully done that's gorgeous Elizabeth someone asked a question that I think it was connect I, I this is total self-interest too so Ju Julie Langsom asked this question that I think I was trying to get at and maybe I, I wasn't I, I didn't articulate it as clearly as she did she says do you have a different attachment to the paper ephemera versus the digital um, yes, 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 yes. Um, I used to call myself a digital archivist. Um, you know, what happens with most collectors after a while is that being a custodian of old paper becomes a burden. And, you know, there are institutions that I think could do it much better, probably make it more available. And I kind of long for that day when everything's digitized and I'm actually, I, I consider myself a master technician with regards to digitization. Um, and yeah, I think um, I look forward to that day where, you know, I can reclaim my space and the physical artifacts um, have a forever home that uh, can do a great job with making them accessible. I'll probably always keep an exhibit collection, but my dream is really to be able to um, create new interesting ways of interacting with this digital material. You know, I love chronologies and timelines and so much of these movements intersect in so many different ways. One of the, um, so one of the pieces uh, that I have at the Smithsonian um, is actually this, the companion piece to the Faith Ringgold that is Jerry's backdrop right here. And it was the featured piece in their Black Arts kiosk um, in the inaugural exhibit. And the last time I went back, they had actually digitized it. And in another room, they had an interactive digital display where they used that as a signature piece where you go into a wall size, essentially iPad screen, where you can pick this one piece, you can swipe, you know, you can go follow one thread to the black arts movement or 
follow another thread to the feminist movement, follow another thread to Angela Davis and political prisoners. And uh, so, yeah, as technology evolves, um, I just think there are so many exciting ways that we can bring this to life and also gather the stories that are out there. You know, I have people contacting me from all, all around the world that have little nuggets. I wish, that, I wish there was some way to really pull that together. And I know there's some, you know, new media designer out there who's just looking for a project. So, yeah. There are some great questions in both the chat and the Q&A area. I'm not sure who's moderating those, but we have a, like a lot of really good questions. Yeah, Austin, we only have about 20 minutes, so maybe we should we should turn to to the questions. And um, and some of them are in chat also. I see. I see. Yeah. There's a comment. Okay, but there's some really good questions. Okay, so um, I'm going to just throw this question out there. This is from Lucy. She says. Can you all talk about your thoughts on the relevance of the catalog and Angela's work um, to the present moment? How does it speak to what we're experiencing right now? I guess that's for anyone. Well, I, I think, I mean, we are at a, a moment where I think, where for me, for a lot of people who've been doing work around ending prisons, um, you know, and doing it often in, in communities and without a lot of visibility to have a national conversation, even if it feels like it's at times a misguided conversation around what abolition means. Um, it, it does speak to the fact that Angela Davis and many of her colleagues and fellow activists have been doing this work, planting these seeds, building these relationships for literally decades. Mm -hmm. um, critical resistance was formed in the early, in, I think the mid nineties, but you know, as we have all said, Angela Davis is aware of prison as, you know, as one of the, you know, pillar sites of state repression and comes out of prison really not just speaking on behalf of that, but also really working collectively with people across the carceral divide um, to not only bring more greater awareness to it, but also to really critically and thoughtfully envision a world that's not about human caging. And she has, you know, done a series of books, some of them that are, you know, decades old that we're still reading to this day. We're still learning from um, the work she did in prison. We're still learning from, you know, the work that she did collectively with other people, many of them who are no longer here. But um, even though maybe some of the, institu the institutions look different, that the, the um, sheer brutality and dehumanization and, um, captivity and premature death of state repression of prisons, that has been enduring. And I think we're, so I think that the lessons are still there in her work and in, in the way that she lives her life. Hmm. And I, I just like to, to say that I think one of the, um, one of the, the other important things to think about is that the moment that we're living in now has a long history. And I think that some of what this book aims to do and this exhibition, it is really to, to, to bring out how long the struggle has been, how difficult the history is. And, and you know, I'm, I have to say how, how um, not well known and, and a little bit hidden this history is. Um, and one of our, our goals was really to bring to light a story that was not known by many people in the details and, and to really um, talk about it as a, as, a, as a continuum that has that has been going on for many, many years, even before Angela Davis. I mean, you know, Angela Davis's um, mother was herself an activist and there's generations and generations of, of especially black women activists that have, that are not as well known as they should be. So 
that's part of the story that we're trying to tell too with this. I don't know if you guys, if Lisbeth, you have to add anything to that. Uh, no, I feel like I've been doing all the talking. <laughs> um, to build on that last question for, this is, I guess, maybe more for Donna and Jerry. This is from Rhea Swain, who's a student at Rutgers. She says, um, what do you hope that students um, will take away from this exhibition when it opens next year? So thinking about the audience, I guess. Donna, do you wanna go first? Or? Um, sure, so, you know, I have, I have always um, thought of this as being a perfect exhibition for the university and for a university art museum to do. And my, my dream has always been that a great mass of the archive actually arrives in the, in the museum and that um, students are able to, you know, carefully and with supervision help kind of look through the archive so that we have a continually rotating group of things out on view, which to me will present the complications of history but also um, let students who are often reading history books understand that history is an edited version of all the events that happen. So, you know, that's always been part of um, how I saw this exhibition. But in a, as I said before, also, I, th I think the idea of history as a living document and history as something that doesn't, um, that doesn't end, but continues to create forces that, that we have to wrestle with in the present is, is, a, is a big theme for me in this exhibition. And um, I think by the time we open in 2021, you know, we'll see what, uh, what the American political landscape looks like. And, um, you know, th this show, you know, in a lot of ways is, is going to be presented in a time that we didn't, ex that I don't, I don't know what it, how it's going to, how it's going to work, but um, we have time to figure that out. But, you know, and those are all good things and positive things and, um, well, not all positive, but hopefully it's a positive 2021. Um, do you want to add something, Jerry? Just, just that I hope students will, be able to spend time, as you say, with the archive. And one of the things that we wanted to do was, was allow space for people to dig into it and find different things. So there's not a simple, there's not a history. There are multiple histories that they can, that they can follow through the archive or discover in the archive and then track uh, somewhere else. Um, the, the, the whole, the first room that, you know, Don and I have that whole thing laid out months ago now. But the first room, uh, one of the emphases in the first room is on prison writing. So it would, there'd be a reading space where, you know, students could, could engage with that. And hopefully, depending on, on what they take from that, maybe, um, you know, dig into what is happening in prisons now in terms of, uh, you know, uh, writing that's going on in prisons and maybe what forms it's taking now um, or art that's going on in prisons now as, as uh, Nicole's uh, exhibition kind of so wonderfully uh, opens up to many people who may not have been aware that any art was going on in prison now by incarcerated people. So I think it, it, it'll be a place where people can dig into things, not just Angela's history, but these other histories as well. And I just want to, I want to also say that it's, it was also very important that we include contemporary artists. And I, I, I want, um, because history, you know, is a linear story, but, but the way artists kind of absorb, speak about, um, tell stories about history is, is not necessarily, not necessarily linear. And so, having contemporary artists sort of wrestling with these issues and the history and the present um, brings a whole nother level of, of I think, understanding and um, engagement in, in some way, so.
-hmm. All of those things, I hope, the exhibition will do. And I'm sure it will. So um, the next question um, comes from Kiki Michael. Uh, it's directed towards Elizabeth and you talked briefly about the first part, but the second part is definitely very interesting. She says, what was your biggest challenge in collecting this archive? And what advice can you give as we're living through the Black Lives Matter movement to capture the story of today? Ooh. Um biggest challenge um you know i mean building an archive is a commitment it's commitment of space it's commitment of resources it's a commitment of you know time and energy um and you know i feel like capturing the story of today um you know i don't know that i ever stop to think about the story, my goal was really to build a resource where future generations could come in and mine for the stories. You know, things like political posters, for example, were disposable. They're not meant to survive. So my focus was always on preserving this while I could. Um, you know, I've had a lot of discussions with my partner around the Black Lives Matter movement because in a lot of ways I'm positioned to do that as well. But, um, you know, to tackle preserving any movement or building an archive of, of any movement is, it's a, it's a large commitment and I feel like, um, you know, there are, hopefully there are people who are archiving what's happening right now because, you know, it's important. And 50 years from now, which is how far out we are from Angela's first stories, um, you have no idea of how relevant it's going to be. So, <sighs> Yeah, I would say the challenge really is, um, you know, this is not something that, um, you know, not a lot of people are built from this, for this. You know, my partner could live in a monastery or, you know, have one chair in an empty room and be perfectly happy. And I was not built that way. You know, there is some psychological component that, allows someone to, you know, put value on, on an object and see value in it as a historical artifact. You know, that's a, is it a disease? I don't know. But anyway, I have that gene. Uh, yeah. Lisbeth, could I follow up on that one? Is, is mm -hmm. there like, is there one piece that you knew was there and you, you had to track it for ages and eventually you got it, or you're still looking for it? Is there anything, was, was there a challenge like that? Or was it just the challenge that there was too much? You know, I, I guess, hmm. you know, I think what I really invested in was building a robust resource that was not really about having one key piece. Mm -hmm. Though I will say that piece behind you, the Faith Ringgold, yeah. um, probably represents one of those pieces. It, um, you know, it's such a, it's such an important connective tissue you know, it's been called the first, um, you know, feminist piece of the Black arts movement. Um, you know, I actually, I, I scored it relatively inexpensively. And uh, when I saw Ringgold's, I saw the signature Ringgold, I went just online to try and Google to see, could this be a fake Ringgold? And I ended up on some website having a correspondence 
you know, what do you know about this piece? Do you know how many? And, you know, I'm going on for like an hour until I realize I'm actually corresponding with Faith herself. Wow. And yeah, wow. <laughs> I'm really glad I didn't tell her how much I paid for the piece because that would have been disappointing. <laughs> and um, yeah, so, you know, there are pieces that have bigger significance to me, but it's, you know, at this point, um, it's really about adding more pieces to the jigsaw puzzle that will illuminate new threads that future scholars and filmmakers and whatnot can, you know, go wherever they're going to go with, you know, I don't, I don't, um, think about the story so much. I don't feel like that's my job. Mm. Oh, I think we have time for maybe one more. Does that sound right? Um, so this is from Gustav Friedrich. Um, he says, do you have a view of how the archive and exhibition can inform and change the future of political activism? If it can. Thoughts? One of the things that I put in um, the chat was I just, uh, Elizabeth was kind of just poking fun of herself saying, you know, it's, is it a disease or whatever, but there are studies of people who collect, right? That there is like a, there is a, <laughs> there's kind of a way of looking at the world that collectors have. Um, but we also know that the history of collecting is, is, is connected to a colonial project. It's collected, connected to who writes history, who dominates. And I think what Elizabeth is doing is such a radical revisioning of what is a value, what the future generation needs to know, right? Um, how to tell a story differently because I certainly don't want to, I certainly don't want my great great grandchild to learn about Angela Davis through the, through, you know, state narratives, right? We need to have other narratives that people will really understand the complexity and the power, not the complexity of a moment, but also what she actually stood for. And the state's not going to tell us what she stood for. We're not going to get that from the state, right? Um, and, you know, we think, we think about other figures right now that we're trying, you know, that we're learning of in much more complex ways. The, what my son knows about Harriet Tubman in 2020 is not what I was raised to know about Harriet Tubman when I was in school, right? So we have to have other people collecting and allowing space for uh, new histories and stories to be told. A figure. So, I mean, that's one thing that I think is really absolutely essential to that. But I also want to say that there's so many, and I don't mean oddball, like, you know, there's just so many quirky things in your archive that I didn't expect to come across, like those court drawings of Angela Davis, the court renditions, they're really incredible. And I was actually, I actually wrote about, uh, about it in my essay because I was so, because that's also telling us about a type of art like carcel art making that was taking place at the time that it's not really so common now right but that was super it, you know in the mid early mid 20th century that was often the way that people um got kind of visuals of, of a court case mm. so i'm just saying there are all kinds of things in there that i i hope that i would love for a greater audience to be aware of And I can say that um, in answer to the question, I, I hope that um, the exhibition introduces people to the idea of different stories and history as being a much more complicated um, series of decisions and, you know, a, a, just a, a, as Nicole pointed out, you know, it depends on who's telling the story, right? So Elizabeth is doing this fantastic job of creating an alternative story that can be pulled out of her archive. And that's a different story than the state archive story. 
I was frantically flipping through to try to find the um, the court sketches. Mm. Um, I just have to add, if I disappear all of a sudden, um, my computer's running low on batteries. Oh, well, we're almost out of time, so. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. I see my girls all up in the chat. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, you were getting lots of love in that chat, Lizette. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, it was great to be together with you all virtually yes. celebrating this book and ex upcoming exhibition and more importantly Angela Davis. Oh, yes. sketches. Thank yeah. you, Lizbeth. And one, yeah. one thing I'd say, Lizbeth, the batteries aren't going to run out on the archive. This is the mm -hmm. this is the problem with digital digital life. Right. That's you know, right. whereas your archive is is there, you know. It, it, there, there are complexities to that, and you mentioned some of them, and you know uh, the advantages of, of digital things. But just the fact that you're running out of battery, you know. I agree. You know, actually, as a digital archivist, I've actually come through the other side of the rabbit hole, and to me now, it is all about publishing. So yeah. once again, I just have to give kudos to the entire team that created this book because I feel like. You know, when the big electromagnetic pulse comes and all of our digital, you know, backups go the way of the dinosaur, yeah. paper, paper probably has the best chance of survival. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. All of that publish and backup in triplicate. Okay. Okay. Well, I want to thank, thank everyone for coming. Thank you. Um, to Jerry and Lisbeth and Nicole. Um, you guys have really made the project a fantastic project. And um, thank you so much for coming out tonight to have a conversation about it all. Thanks, everyone. Stay yeah. healthy and well. Thank you. Yeah, that was great. Thank you to, to everyone who came. And thank you, Austin, for showing the slides as well. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah, thanks to everyone who, who's on behind the scenes making this happen. This would, I look forward to meeting you in person. Um, actually, yeah, I'm going to hit you up and get your information about that. Uh, Absolutely. I have something for you, too. Okay. Okay. All right, all. Bye. 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 Bye.